good to hear you singing the praises of the Lord. We're going to turn together in God's word this evening to Colossians and the chapter 1. Paul's letter to the Colossians and to the chapter 1. We're going to read some verses together, commencing at verse 1. Colossians 1 and the verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come on to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Amen. We land there at verse 8. Uh, just a short reading from God's Word, and we trust that He will add His own blessing to this public reading of His own precious and infallible Word. Tonight I just want to come to an introduction to Colossians. And the verses that we have read together really form that introduction. Now, when you come to the commencement of any letter or any book in the Bible, it's good to establish a number of things, first of all. The first thing you would want to establish is the person who wrote the book. And then next, you would want to establish who is written to. And then the third and important thing to establish is the purpose of why the letter or the book was written in the first place. Now, when you come to think of those three things, the first thing is the person who wrote the book. Well, that's very easy for us because the key is in the door here. The very opening of the letter and the very first word is Paul. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And so we know that this letter comes from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Whenever we receive a letter, and we don't often get many handwritten letters today, in these days of computers and mobile phones, it's normally texts or emails or something like that. But if you received a written letter, maybe you would cast your eye down to the end of the letter before you would read it, because you want to know who sent it? You want to know who the letter is from? Well, in the Bible, the letters have the author at the beginning and not the end. And so you can see here right at the very outset of Colossians that this is from Paul the Apostle. And the second thing we said that you have to establish is the people written to so if Paul is the author, who is, the, who is he writing to? And it tells us very clearly here in verse 2, it's to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. And so he's writing to God's people at Colossae. He's writing to the church at Colossae. And if there hadn't been a church at Colossae, we would probably never have heard of that place. If you were to take a Bible map and pinpoint it, you would find it's approximately 
a hundred miles from Ephesus, and it's close to Laodicea and also to Herapolis, and those places are mentioned in this letter. But the church at Colossae, that's the people that the Apostle Paul was writing to. It wasn't a church that the Apostle founded. It wasn't a church that he founded directly, but it would appear to have been a church that became an outreach from Ephesus. And from that outreach, that witness from Ephesus, the church was established at Colossae. And they had a minister at Colossae who was a faithful minister. If you were following there in verse 7, you can see that his name was Epaphras. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. And so the Apostle Paul was able to speak about the church at Colossae and about God's people there and about their minister. And their minister was Epaphras. But what was the purpose in Paul writing the letter to the church and to God's people at Colossae? It's important to establish why he was writing. Well, there was a serious matter that had developed within the church. There was false doctrine circulating, heretical teaching, and there was a mixing and a mingling going on. A mixing of Eastern orthodoxy and Jewish, or Eastern philosophy, I should say, and also Jewish uh, legalism. And it threatened to destroy the very purity of the gospel message. If you were to look into chapter 2 and to the verse 8, he's telling God's people to beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And this philosophy that was coming as a threat to the church, was involving the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars. It was encouraging the worship of angels. And it was said that there was a greater wisdom that could be obtained, and therefore through that, a greater perfection. And God's people were being deceived by that. And alongside of that, Eastern philosophy, there was the Jewish legalism introducing man-made laws and traditions and regulations. And the Apostle Paul, having been informed of that, he feels that he's compelled to write to God's people at Colossae. And the answer that the Apostle brings here to these problems that God's people were facing was to draw those believers afresh to Christ. And that's really the theme of this letter. Paul is setting forth the Lord Jesus Christ. And really you would say the main theme of the epistle is the preeminence of Christ. And you could look down this chapter 1 to what would really be one of the key verses in the whole of the letter in verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And mark these words, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And that's Paul's main message here. The message to these Colossians that the Lord Jesus Christ must have the preeminence in all things. He will go on in chapter 2 to speak about the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 2 and verse 9, he says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All fullness dwells in him. Then he says there in the very next verse, chapter 2 and verse 10, and ye are complete in him. You're complete in him. Who is the head of 
all principality and power. And here is that completeness of the Savior to his people, that you need no additive, you need nothing else, and you need no one else. It's the Lord Jesus Christ in all his fullness, and in the fullness of the Lord Jesus, you're complete. And he writes this letter to them to emphasize that very point. And this is being noted as one of Paul's most profound letters. It's a letter that contains some of the deepest truths that are taught in the Word of God, truths that we could not fully fathom. But we trust that we're unable to, we're able to unearth some of the treasures contained in this letter to the Colossians. But just by way of introduction this evening, I want you to notice firstly the greeting to the church at Colossae, the greeting. These verses that we have read together, the Apostle Paul is announcing himself and he declares his office. And he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that's his office an office that many would have questioned. Many would have sought to undermine the apostleship of the Apostle Paul. And he's not stating this out of any pride. He's not coming to usurp that particular office. He's not coming to lay hold upon it by way of his own efforts or his own achievements. It's not by the will of the flesh. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. That's what's important. It was not by his own will. It was by the will of God. And how important it is to know the will of God in relation to our service for the Lord. We had our sister Noreen McAfee with us last Tuesday night, and she read from Romans 12, the verses 1 and 2, and she was emphasizing for us the will of God. And how it tells us there that the will of God is good, and the will of God is acceptable, and the will of God is perfect. And we must see here the Apostle Paul, that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And whatever we are, or wherever we are, let's take that humble position that it's by the will of God. It can never be of ourselves. And so he announces himself in this greeting. But then he addresses God's people in this greeting, the words of verse 2. And he says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, you would read those words, perhaps you could just pass over them quickly and you would want to get on into the chapter and on through the letter, but we do well to dwell upon those words, that description that the apostle gives of God's people. You could ponder it slowly and carefully. He calls them saints to the saints. They weren't saints because they had been canonized by the Pope or canonized by the church. They're saints because they're converted. They're saints because they're in Christ Jesus. And then he says they're faithful brethren, faithful band of believers. Oh, they may have been going through a troublesome time here in the church at Colossae, and whatever situation it was that they presently found themselves in, Paul had heard enough from their minister Epaphras to say they're faithful brethren. That work and that witness there at Colossae, they're the saved of the Lord, they're saints, and they're faithful brethren. And you look at those words, in Christ. 
saints and faithful brethren in Christ. What a privileged position that is. What a blessing it is to be found in Christ and to know his so great salvation. And so he addresses God's people at Colossae. And then he has an appeal for God's people at Colossae. Also in that second verse, he says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he has that appeal for these dear brothers and sisters in the Lord at Colossae that are undergoing a time of trouble and they're beset by the devil, Paul says to them, grace and peace be on to you. It's like a double, it's like a double greeting there. The Gentiles would have used the greeting grace when they would have encountered one another, grace. And the Jews would have used the greeting, Shalom, that's peace. And so Paul uses the double greeting to them, that these saints and faithful brethren in Christ Jesus at Colossae, he says, grace and peace be unto you. They weren't just empty words, not just a vain expression that's used by the apostle, but it shows his love, and the warmth and the affection that he had for God's people. And the desire that he had for them to know grace and peace in the midst of their situation. And so you see something there by way of the greeting to the church. But notice secondly the gratitude for the church. In verse 3 he expresses this gratitude. We give thanks. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And here was a prayer of thankfulness to the Lord, a prayer of thankfulness for those saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. And in all of the matters that the Apostle Paul would have to address, and there were uh, some matters of concern that he would have to deal with, but first and foremost, his heartfelt thanks to God for the work and the witness at Colossae, for the testimony of God's people there. The Apostle Paul, he always exhibited that spirit of thankfulness. If you were to glance back just a little bit in your Bible, Philippians chapter 4 is not very far away. And in Philippians chapter 4 and the verse 6, the apostle said there to the believers at Philippi, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And he's exhorting there the Philippians to have that spirit of thanksgiving. Ephesians isn't that far away either, backing up just a little more. In Ephesians chapter 5 and the verse 4, as he writes there to the saints at Ephesus, he said in chapter 5 and verse 4, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Give thanks. Ephesians 5 and the verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was a recurring theme with the Apostle Paul. Oh, that prayer of thankfulness. Going in the opposite direction from Colossians, the next book would be 1 Thessalonians and in 1 Thessalonians, the chapter 5 and the verse 18, you can see it again. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Giving thanks to the Lord. And as Paul writes to these Colossians, before he says anything else to them, he wants to pray and to thank God for them. 
thankfulness to the Lord. You remember in Luke chapter 17, the ten lepers, and the Lord healed the ten lepers, and as you read on in that particular account, it says one of them. And it was just one out of the ten. One returned to give him thanks. It's good to remember to give thanks on to the Lord. And the apostle is thanking the Lord for the saints and the faithful brethren at Colossae. But there were particular things that he was thanking God for concerning them. You look at verse 4 of our Bible reading. He says that it's since we heard. There are certain things that he has heard about and he has heard, no doubt, from Epaphras, their faithful minister. Oh, whenever there's negative news, that negative news seems to travel fast. But here's positive news. And Epaphras carried that positive news to the Apostle Paul, and he reported of the believers at Colossae. And he was able to give a good report concerning them. And Paul then begins to thank God for them. And he says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, he heard about their faith. He heard about the Lord beginning to move there at Colossae. He heard about the advancement of the gospel, souls getting gloriously saved, the church being formed, and the work beginning to, to build up. Now, that, that delights the heart of the apostle, delights the heart of every child of God. He says, I thank God for your faith in Christ Jesus. That's saving faith. And then something else that he had heard about there, and he had heard about it in verse 4, it's recorded, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. You could note there just in passing the word all, the love which ye have to all the saints. It's easy to love some of the saints. Some of the saints are easy to love. It's more difficult to love all of the saints. But oh, he'd heard the report about those believers at Colossae. Not only about their faith, but about their love. And the love that they had one for the other. And the love for all the saints. There's that little chorus and it says, To dwell above with saints we love will certainly be glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, well that's another story. But here at Colossae, God's people had that particular attribute and that grace that they had a love for all the saints. How? How were they able to do that? Well, when you look there into uh, the verse 8, it says, Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. And it was only by the power and the help of the Holy Spirit of God that they were able to manifest that love to all of the saints. My, it's impossible in our own strength and by ourselves, but with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, we can know that love, the one for the other. Be gracious, be kind, to be meek, to be tender, to have that love to all the saints. Paul says, I'll thank God for that. Then something else there in verse 5 that he thanked God for. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And as he's thanking God for their faith and thanking God for their love, so he thanks God for their hope, the hope that they had in Christ, that hope of glory, that future blessing, that inheritance, that prospect that lies before every child of God. The Colossians were filled with that hope. And he thanked God for that. And so just by way of these verses of introduction, 
you can see the greeting to the church and you can see the gratitude for the church. But thirdly, and just very quickly, you can also see the growth of the church. Verse 6 says, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. And since the gospel, the word of the gospel came there to that location to Colossae and souls were converted and the church began to, to build up and there was that growth and there was that fruit there. Faithful, faithful brethren in Christ Jesus, the faithful are now fruitful. And they're producing fruit in their lives and they're seeing that fruit in the increase and the advancement of the gospel around them. And if we can increase in the faith and increase in our love and increase in our hope, then we'll be fruitful. And we will grow and we will see that progress and that advancement. Oh, the devil will seek to attack. No wonder he was attacking the work at Colossae because they were a faithful and a fruitful people and the devil was wanting to get in to cause division. But in spite of the devil-inspired attacks, he could thank God for these faithful brethren and for the growth that they were experiencing in the church at Colossae. Isn't that what we desire for the work of God here in Hillsborough. As we come to approach a new term of work together, then every capacity and every aspect of the work of God, we want to set forth the Lord Jesus Christ in all his fullness. And we want the Lord to have all the preeminence. And we want the Lord to bless us with that fruit and with that growth. I believe if we lay hold upon the Lord earnestly together that the Lord will hear, the Lord will answer our cry, and the Lord will visit us here in this corner and that we would see that growth and that progress even in this new term that we're about to enter. May the Lord bless just these thoughts to our hearts this evening from these introductory verses to uh, the letter of Colossians. We're going to sing another hymn together. It's the hymn 637. 637. Here from the world we turn, Jesus to seek. Here may his loving voice tenderly speak. Jesus, our dearest friend, while at thy feet we bend, O oh, let thy smile descend, tis thee we seek the hymn 637.
May that be the desire of our hearts this evening, that we long for the Lord, and we long for that visitation from the Lord. Let me thank each one again for coming along tonight to our midweek prayer meeting and Bible study. May the Lord now give us help as we come around the throne of grace in prayer. We're delighted tonight to see our clerk of session, Mr. David Williamson, and we're going to ask our brother if he would lead us off in prayer tonight, and then as many as possible, let's have a good solid half an hour of prayer one after another, and let us seek God's face together. Just some matters that I would remind you of before we come to our prayer time. Uh, Thursday night is the prayer meeting for our workers here in this corner. And whatever capacity of service, uh, we need the blessing and the help of the Lord. And so Thursday night, here again at 8 p.m. And if you want to come and to join with us, you will be most welcome. Friday morning, the tiny treasures at 9.30. Then Friday evening, the Youth Council National Rally. And we do appreciate those that have indicated that they're available to help on Friday evening. Saturday evening is the reach in the village hall. Do please remember that effort as well in your prayers. And then on the Lord's Day, the recommencement of the Sabbath school and Bible class and our services both morning and evening. Do remember please those who are sick and those who are sorrowing at this time. There's our missionaries and our students and there is the recommencement of the Whitfield College of the Bible and that service on Monday night in Bellamina uh, to mark the commencement again of the Whitfield College. Do remember please some matters. Uh, the work in Uganda, uh, our sister Noreen was with us last Tuesday night and she made that appeal, the need for a man uh, to go to the land of Uganda. Then from our presbytery on Friday evening, we have learned that that prayer was answered and a man has come forward, uh, the Reverend Ray Kerskadden, the minister of our church in Korragari. Uh, he feels called and burdened of the Lord uh, to go to the land of Uganda. And so do pray for him as in this next six months to a year, uh, he will be going around our churches on deputation uh, to seek support and the prayers of God's people as he makes plans in the will of the Lord uh, to go to Uganda. And so we're thankful for that. Do remember the work in Tavistock as well. There is a vacancy there. There's a man needed in Tavistock. Uh, Mr. Stephen Miller has stepped down from the work there. And so we would ask you to remember uh, the work in Tavistock in your prayers. We also have a new deputy moderator after Friday night, and that's the Reverend Samuel Murray. Uh, the minister of our church in Port of Ogie. And so do remember the Reverend Murray as he takes up the role of deputy moderator. There's also a new chairman for our mission board. The Reverend Ian Harris has stepped down after the 10 year term and that has been filled by the Reverend Colin Mercer. And so do remember him as well as he takes on that responsibility within our mission board. Then pray as well for uh, the evangelistic mission in Lisburn, there on the site of the old burn house in the tent. Uh, do pray for souls to be saved, and if you're available any night, do seek to get along. Do remember our land at this time with all of the problems uh, that would face our land and nation. Uh, do remember our land that the Lord would hear and answer prayer, and we would know times of reviving from the 